there, destruction as far as the eye can see, fires smoldering, some still burning even after the worst winds had passed. Entire lots of homes. The mayor calls it the worst storm ever, ever to hit a city. Chairs, you're looking at uh, just remnants of what were homes over here. You may be able to see the foundations, but the home itself completely gone. I can remember within 24 hours being on the phone with President Obama. One senior said to me, you know, I can't, I can't even, I can't get out, and just literally cried in my arms. And then I remember getting an email from a parent, but she ended the email by saying, but if we didn't get her house restored by the end of that day, she was going to send her teenager to live with me. And it just, you know, that for me it was really the moment where I felt like we've got to be able to do this in a different way. And we began losing customers, not a wire at a time, but a, but a circuit at a time. Whether you were the President of the United States or a heart surgeon or a concerned parent, at that point in time, it was urgent. Right? Whether it was just 24 hours, whether it was 72 hours, whether it was 10 days, enough was enough and you needed to have your lights back on. So when Hurricane Sandy made an impact, I remember we had a couple of days warning. I knew that um, the power would go out. And I actually brought some clothes to stay overnight in the office. I knew it would be flooded. So I um, packed my bags and uh, I stayed here at City Hall. It's about 6 p.m. and the storm's full fury was allegedly on New Jersey at that time. And we were still in great shape. And I was convinced we had dodged another bullet and we would be okay. Within the span of the next half hour, we lost 90% of our customers. It was, it was devastating for Hoboken. The water came in from the north and the south and um, literally filled up um, like 80% of our city with the floodwaters. What we didn't realize is that the wind from the storm was not going to be the issue. Typically, that's what knocks down the power lines. The wind from the storm was going to shift the tides and a lot of low-lying areas, which are important to us from the point of view of where our infrastructure is located, then got inundated. Our fire state, three of our four fire stations were underwater, our senior center, our DPW, um, all of our substations, so the power was out. Um, everyone's homes, you know, Hoboken is a, a city where, you know, everyone lives in a garden level apartment and uh, their homes were completely flooded. So the immediate devastation came in two forms. Uh, form one was the, the, the ground was soaked, some trees would come down and take the wires down with them. But more than that, we found literally that our substations had water levels that got into the cabinets, got into the relays, got into the, to the infrastructure and took out thousands of customers at a time. Some of our power plants, they had a lot of their electrical equipment that converts the output from the power plant to something that can be used by customers, got flooded. So the, the damage to physical equipment was extensive and took literally days and weeks to recover from. The challenge that has made grid modernization so important uh, is that sea level rise is much more pronounced and is occurring much more rapidly than even some of the early models had predicted. So historically, where did industry and infrastructure develop? It was where you had easy access to transportation. Many, many years ago, it was along the waterways. So much of our service territory has at, at, at its core an infrastructure base that's in low-lying areas. There's no one-size-fits-all approach to a modern grid, but what we do know for sure is that we need to reduce our emissions across the board here in the U.S. and abroad. We need to prioritize reliability and resiliency. And for that, things like distributed energy, local sources of energy, and redundancies across the system, adding in storage and backup generation is absolutely critical to meet the needs of the 21st century. 20 years ago, before the LEED Green Building rating system was in existence, tenants, owners, architects, engineers were lacking a common language. 
Many tenants and owners were saying to their architects or real estate companies that they wanted to be in a green building, and yet no one really knew how to define what a green building is. So LEED came around and created a common set of tools, metrics, and guidelines so that everyone could operate from the same playbook and be speaking the same language. And now, 20 years later, LEED has transformed the building sector. Everyone knows that if you're in a LEED Gold building or a LEED Platinum building, it means that you have reduced your impact to the environment across a wide variety of areas. Across the board, everyone wants distributed energy or other types of local sources of energy or resiliency and reliability or smart grid, microgrid, all of these things, and yet there's no common language uniting stakeholders around a common goal. USGBC's peer allows us to compare how we are doing with others in the industry. What, what can we learn from one another in terms of using customer-centric data to assess performance, uh, to assess how one utility is empowering customers to do things that maybe another utility is not? You know, it wasn't that long ago where in this industry you couldn't pay your bill online. What PEER does is it demonstrates to customers, investors, regulators, and other stakeholders that an electricity system is performing at the highest possible levels in terms of resiliency, sustainability, reliability, efficiency, cost effectiveness, and everything in between. Hoboken is a perfect example of how a community can utilize PEER to drive outcomes in their electricity infrastructure modernization. The city is working on many fronts, so we were, um, we were able to work with the Department of Energy and do an analysis for a microgrid um, project, and then we were able to get more grant money, and we're continuing to do the feasibility analysis. So when we redid Washington Street, our main street, we put the fiber all the way down so that we're going to be in a place to do the microgrid once we um, you know, sort of finalize all of the, the details in the, in the final plan. They are constructing a microgrid that will layer in local generation and redundancies and ensure that critical services are there for their citizens, even in the case of future natural disasters. We're also working with PSE&G. Um, so we are raising up our um, substations and combining the two, two of the substations together and raising them up. So that, those projects have um, begun or, and they're going to be starting construction. So some of the characteristics of a grid going forward, I think, should really be viewed in, in across three lenses. First of all, I think the most important thing we have to do is pay much more attention to energy efficiency. So use as little as possible. Make whatever you use as clean as possible and then deliver it as reliably as possible. That third piece is a combination of data management and a more robust from a construction standard grid. I think the most transformative energy grid phenomenon taking place right now is the ability to manage data in ways that we couldn't manage data before. If I can understand customer usage patterns down to the individual customer and I can figure out how to mix and match that and how to make my grid smart enough so that some grouping of customers can be served with one set of standards and another group of customers can be served with a different set of standards. And I don't just mean in terms of power quality standards, I mean in terms of distributed resources. Then I can get to a customer segment of one. And, and that is very different than the way in which the grid grew up. The life lesson that was solidified for me was just thinking about the importance of being prepared. Every community really needs to get prepared. Think about what is the potential impact for climate change um, on your community. So that's something that I, I'm really proud of. 